many of you who are listening may have undergone a recent facelift. I'm going to discuss with you the types of complications that people encounter following a facelift and what can be done to mitigate the, the complications. I'm Dr. Joel Kopelman. I'm a facial plastic surgeon, and I've been performing facelifts for the past 30 years, and I have seen many facelift uh, complications from other doctors, and I am going to give you insight today on how to deal and manage these possible complications that arise uh, following a facelift procedure. I want to first emphasize that there are things that occur following a facelift that are totally expected, like swelling, bruising, uh, some numbness, maybe some distortion of the face. These things are expected. And you can check out my previous video on recovery from a facelift to get more detailed information there about what to expect. Today, we're going to delve, however, into a deeper uh, dive into actual serious complications that can occur following a facelift and how to treat them and how to uh, mitigate the, the side effects that can occur. So the first complication that somebody may encounter is a bleed or a hematoma underneath the skin flap. If there's a large collection of blood underneath the skin flap, that has to be evacuated by the surgeon. That means you have to go back to the operating room or the treatment room, they have to open it up and drain that clot of blood out of there because it can compromise the flap. You can reduce the risk of developing a hematoma uh, following the procedure or during the procedure by avoiding any blood thinners prior to surgery. So Advil, Motrin, vitamin E, fish oil, any blood thinners. And if you're on an anticoagulant, you're probably not even a candidate for having a facelift because it's sometimes dangerous to discontinue the use of the anticoagulant uh, for cardiac reasons. But that's how to mitigate the risk. It doesn't eliminate the risk, it reduces the risk. The second possible uncommon co complication is infection. Now, some people do develop staph infections uh, following the procedure. And this complication can also be anticipated to some extent, not entirely, but to some extent, by actually culturing the nose and the ear prior to surgery. Because sometimes people harbor what's called MRSA staph in their nose and their ear. And if we culture prior to surgery, uh, there, we at least know that there is a possibility that an infection could occur, and we could take steps to avoid the infection. In addition, while I'm performing these procedures, I soak the sutures in betadine and, and bacitracin uh, mix to uh, prevent any seeding of any bacteria underneath the flap with, from a woven suture. So that's another way to reduce the risk of having an infection underneath the flap. The third complication that I encounter is patients who have had uh, facelifts and they develop nerve weakness or nerve paralysis. Now, most of the time, if there's a nerve that's injured during the procedure, it's temporary. The nerve will regenerate within approximately six months and, and the function of the face will come back. The facial nerve comes out from behind the ear and innervates the muscles of facial movement here so they can get injured uh, in the process. Now, it can, why that happens is the, the surgeon sometimes is in a deeper plane than they actually um, uh, believe they are in, and they mistakenly think that they're in a more superficial plane, but they're actually in a deeper plane. In deep plane facelifts, actually lead to more facial nerve injuries because that's the plane in which the nerve travels. So there is some greater risk in those procedures. I'm not saying they're bad procedures. They're great procedures in terms of the ultimate aesthetic improvement. However, there's some greater risk involved. Now, in terms of the neck, 
sometimes making incision uh, below the chin and going up over the over the jawline, some people bag what's called the marginal mandibular branch, which can change a person's uh, ability to move their lower lip and, uh, and sometimes creates distortion of their lip. So that also takes time to recover. And sometimes these nerve injuries are permanent. It's rare, but they do occur. And you have to be aware that's one of the risks involved. Scarring is another complication that I see very often. And uh, it, it occurs for two different reasons. So the scars typically will either occur underneath the chin where the incision is made or more commonly around the ear. So the incision for a facelift is usually around uh, the hairline, around this little tuft of hair, up over the ear and down around the earlobe and behind the ear. Uh, when the surgeon is very enthusiastic about tightening the face, sometimes they tighten it so tight that actually scars are become more hypertrophic uh, on closure. So if you don't close the skin uh, in a gentle fashion, so to speak, uh, and you pull too tight, you can actually get ischemia along the uh, area of, of closure, and that leads to ropey scars. And I've seen many patients who've had thick scars along this area. It's not because they necessarily keloid, but they actually are caused due to uh, over t over tightening the skin layer uh, upon closure. Uh, maybe they trimmed the skin too tightly and they closed it under attention. Uh, so in those cases, either they those patients either have to have a revision of their uh, incisions if if there's enough tissue to mobilize to cover the areas, or they have to have injections of of steroids or what's called 5-FU to soften the scars along that, those areas. Now, sometimes the scarring is extensive and it leads to white scars uh, behind the ear, in front of the ear, and patients cannot uh, wear their hair back because the scarring is so extensive. Related to scarring is also distortion of the ears. So some people have their ears pulled down in what I call a pixie ear or devil's ear. So instead of having a loose uh, lobule, uh, which is natural, their ear is pulled down um, vertically ag against their, their uh, jawline. And that's due, again, to over trimming this area uh, too tightly. And when, it, when there's contraction uh, following the healing of the incisions, the ear is actually pulled down and distorted. Uh, that could be quite unsightly. And sometimes there's a lot of asymmetry between both, both ears. Uh, which uh, require revision. Sometimes it's difficult to revise those patients because there isn't a lot of extra skin to pull up. Uh, so we do our best in those cases. Another complication is skin necrosis, which is quite rare, uh, but it does occur. And that can occur either due to uh, a patient who is a smoker and we always tell the patients who smoke that they have to discontinue smoking for at least three to four weeks prior to the procedure. And that includes chewing nicotine gum because the nicotine in the, in the cigarettes can cause vasoconstriction, constriction of the blood vessels, and can compromise the skin flap itself so that actually you can get like this black uh, necrosis of the face and very bad scarring as a result of uh, uh, smoking. So uh, we always tell the patients who are smokers they can't smoke. Uh, of course, um, there are other conditions uh, like collagen vascular diseases that can also compromise a skin flap and cause necrosis of the flap. So those patients, we have to be particularly conscious to not uh, perform long skin flaps, but shorter skin flaps, so that the vascular supply to the, to the skin is uh, retained and not compromised. Another complication is called a seroma, and that's a yellow tinge fluid that can occur underneath the skin. Uh, that occurs in patients who've either had uh, compromise of their uh, parotid gland, which produces saliva over here, and or underneath their, their chin where you're operating on their salivary glands underneath the chin, it can produce a yellow tinge fluid that can cause a bogginess to the skin. 
In order to avoid this problem, particularly in the neck, I leave in my drains for at least five days following the surgery and make sure that uh, no more fluid is coming out, even at five days. Sometimes I have to extend it beyond five days. Sometimes I can shorten it. But I leave the drain in a long time to make sure that the seroma does not occur because it can compromise the ultimate result of the, uh, in the neck. In the cheek area, sometimes if people uh, dissect and actually violate what's called the parotid fascia over here and enter into the parotid gland, which is also a salivary gland, that can cause the salivary gland to kind of ooze and leak. And a big lump of seroma can occur underneath the flap. In those cases, sometimes you have to use a seroma drainage system to drain away the, the yellow tinged fluid. And after a day or two, it usually dries up and it's fine. Or sometimes people actually stick a needle into the seroma and drain it on a daily basis until it's dry. But it usually goes away and it's fine. Another complication that I see is patients who've had fat grafts uh, done both on the lower lids or on the uh, face itself. Uh, sometimes the fat graft, which is a living cells, do not take they, they're not nourished the same on both sides. For whatever reason, either the, their technique of the surgeon is different on both sides or the amount of tissue that they inject on both sides is different. But sometimes the fat takes on one side and it doesn't take on the other side. And therefore, the patient has to come back and have gra further grafting done as a secondary procedure to get symmetry between right and left sides. Also, the fat itself, if it's if, the, if too big, if there are large globs of fat injected and not tiny little aliquots of fat uh, injected, uh, sometimes those big globs of fat will cause granulomas and they're difficult to remove sometimes, but they, sometimes they actually have to be cut out. So fat grafting has its pros and cons. It's a good procedure to enhance and augment the face, however, there are some downsides to fat grafting as well. The last complication I want to talk about is hair loss. So uh, sometimes the incisions are made uh, in a way that, first of all, if the if the flap is is sutured too tightly, uh, it can compromise the blood supply to the hair follicles, and people can lose hair uh, in their tuft of hair over here, which uh, which is a dead giveaway that they had a facelift. So we need to make sure that we preserve this hair and, and deal gently with our incisions and closure over here because we don't want to uh, compromise the blood supply to the hair follicles. Also, there are many surgeons who go up uh, in the hairline, especially if you have a deep plane facelift and you're mobilizing a large amount of tissue uh, you make an incision within the hair follicles uh, above here, and I've seen several, uh, particularly women, who've lost hair uh, from that incision. And again, it may be that the incision is too tightly closed and uh, their hair line is recessed. In those cases, they might need hair transplants or hair follicle uh, uh, hair transplants along their hairline to camouflage the incision and camouflage the uh, hair loss. So I've reviewed the most common complications that do occur. I hope I've given you insight into how to reduce the risk of developing these complications and how to manage them. And I personally can manage most of the complications that I've seen uh, from other surgeons. And I hope that you've gained insight while watching this video. If you have any further questions, please leave them below. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Please subscribe to my channel, and I look forward to seeing you in my next video.